So what I wanted to talk this morning about is service, especially when it comes to serving the least. The Bible talks about the poor. The poor will always be with us. The people in need will always be with us. And as a church, we're always taking opportunity to help those in need. We look around us and we see need around us, not only locally, but globally. And because we are the church and we feel that God has called us to be his hands and feet here on this planet, we begin to work on God's behalf. We begin to serve the least. And I feel like the least is are the people that God has a special place in his heart for. And I would have to say that most of us probably drove here in an air conditioning vehicle. For the most part, I think most of us go back to our houses and it's air conditioning. Not many of us are probably wondering what our next meal is going to be or where we're going to get medical care. I think for the most of us, I could probably say that. So I wouldn't say that we're necessarily the least. And so I would probably consider us as the people that God calls and to use our resources to be able to help the least, the ones that do not have. So oftentimes we categorize people between the haves and the have-nots. And thankfully, I fall into the category of the have. But I'm always kind of wondering, I'm always kind of chewing on, I'm chewing in my head how I, I am to serve the least. The least that surround us. We see people in need all over, all over our city. But we also see need all over the world. And in Matthew 25, there in verses 35 through 36, Jesus defines the least as the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned. And he goes on to say that when we serve these people, the people in need, we are serving him. And so this morning, I would like to just present to you four ways in which typically the church serves the least. I wish I could take credit for these four ways. But I can't take credit for it entirely because I actually was inspired by this author uh, named Samuel Wells who wrote the book A Nazareth Manifesto. And he breaks down how the church serves the least in four ways. And so what I wanted to do this morning is just to kind of cover each way. He makes the argument that the last perspective, the last posture, is how God wants us to serve each other and to be with him. I'm not going to say that everything that I talk about this morning is exactly what Mr. Wells writes about in his book, but I do have to say that I was inspired by his writings, even though my perspective might be just a little bit different, particularly in the third way, which he describes that the church serves the least. So what I wanted to do is just start with the first posture that typically we serve the least. And one thing that I want you to keep in mind is that there's not one way that is, that is necessarily better. Most of the time we're doing them all together at the same time as a church. But he makes the case that what we finally want to get to is, is the last posture. Because that's God's will. And that's the Lord's will for us. Here on earth and also when he comes back to establish his kingdom forever. So the first way is uh, that the church typically serves the least is doing for others, doing for the least. And we do for others, right? And this is by way of providing provisions, providing material things to the needy, finances. And we do for people because typically there are things that they cannot do for themselves. What are some of the things? Maybe someone doesn't know where they're going to find their next meal. So we do for people and provide meals for people. Or maybe we want to shelter the homeless. So they have wonderful programs here that are backed by the church that seek to shelter the homeless because they just can't do the things they cannot do for themselves. We try to do for them. Some other examples of things that we do for the people in our community, the least, we hold medical and dental screenings. We have food drives, we have after-school tutoring for at-risk youth, and the list goes on of things that we do for others, that we do for the least, that we do for the have-nots. 
And when we perform these activities, when we do for others, it makes us feel good, right? It makes us feel good because we're using what God has given us and making sure that the least have enough. You know, the author actually questions whether we're the only ones that actually feel good because sometimes he states in his book that even though we feel good about ourselves, they don't necessarily feel good because they're the ones that are receiving the handout. And so they continue to be in, this, in the same state. He also talks about that one of the drawbacks of just doing for others is that the people that have resources, eventually they go back to their regular lives, right? Uh, go back to the routine of their jobs and their families. And, and typically you don't engage the least uh, with a conversation, without a real relationship, and just a genuine interaction. Because when we do things for others, typically we can do these things from a distance. Sometimes the author is a little bit critical because I think doing for is essential and part of ministry, and it's part of ministry, and something that we should continue to do as a church. But one of the arguments that he makes is that we never really build a relationship with the people that are we are trying to see. That once the project is over, once the, the need is filled, we move on to the next project. And really, there's no connection that is developed with the other person. And sometimes it, it can just be about feeling good about ourselves, and that's about it. Some of the biblical examples, and so that's what I'm going to try to do is, out of the four ways, I'm going to try to describe some of the examples that I see in the Bible as well of Jesus doing for others, which, like I said, is an essential part of ministry. Some of the ways that Jesus did for others we see so many of his miracles, how he healed the deaf, right? He healed the blind. Just his death on the cross for the forgiveness of sins was doing for others. He feeding the 5,000, right? These were all activities that Jesus did for others because of his compassion. So then I'm going to move to the next posture of how we serve the least as a church. And it's doing with others. So I went from doing for, but now doing with. So instead of serving others from a distance, someone takes it upon themselves and say, I don't really like just doing for people, giving people stuff because I'm not building a relationship and I'm not interacting. So what I want to do is I want to do things with people. Basically, they walk alongside somebody and they try to help them out. Maybe if it's a, a homeless person that has potential and has attributes and capabilities and, and can thrive in life, he just needs kind of a boost and encouragement in life, just needs somebody to come alongside, kind of walk with them so he can get back on his feet, get into a, some sort of an apartment. So someone who is doing with somebody will try to help him build the resume, will connect them with his contacts. Maybe he knows some people and human resources in the company. We'll connect them with them. Some other ways that people do with others is maybe they go out and help them buy some professional clothes so they can have some good interviews. And you can see how beneficial this would be, right? So this mentality is instead of just giving them fish, why don't we take it another step and why don't we show them how to fish? So this is kind of the perspective of doing with. And the person who is trying to help this homeless person, right, trying to work through his talent, try to draw out his potential, all along he's encouraging him, he's motivating him, he's making sure that he's taking the right steps. But it's no longer just doing for, it's more walking alongside with him and kind of empowering him and allowing him to Take some responsibility for his life, we could say. So some of the examples in the Bible of Jesus doing with others, I see was with his disciples, the way he trained, the way he called, and he sent out his disciples. Some of the examples that I have listed here is Jesus called them to follow him and said he would make them fishers of men. So there was a training, empowerment, walking with them, teaching them ministry, teaching them the good news, how to share, how to minister to others. They performed ministry together, so it's working alongside each other. 
I think there's a model out there that teacher does it first and then he does it with the student and then he sends them out and so they can do it by themselves and then he teachers completely hands off. Kind of that type of mentality is doing with, if you kind of catching my drift. But it's really about empowering the disciples to carry out the same ministry and the promise and the gift of the Holy Spirit for mission empowerment after his resurrection. So I feel like the Holy Spirit really empowers us, right? Walks with us to carry out the, his mission. So that one's the second one. I want to move to this third one, the third way in which the church typically addresses need and helps the least in society. And this is, uh, it's not doing for, just giving provisions and material things to the least. It's uh, not necessarily doing with. This one is being for. It's being for. So this is a little bit different than the previous one. Is because after all the effort that the uh, church member has taken to walk alongside this homeless person, they find out that they're still stuck can't get out of the hole that they're in, all the effort, all the contacts, the resume writing, the training that maybe he connected them with, uh, the education. It just seems like he's not able to get traction. And so uh, the church member does a little bit of investigation to try to see, okay, what's going on here? Why is this person not getting any traction and able to get ahead? So he finds out that this homeless person, the reason why he hasn't been able to get ahead is because he has a a prior conviction. So obviously, every time he goes to a job interview, it goes probably okay. But then they do a, they check his record, and there's this prior conviction, this felony, that is unable to get him to the next step and get him hired so he can start making some income. And so this has been the factor that has really kept him stuck. So the church member is not going to give up on this person, right? So he says, okay, that is the root cause. So he goes and talks to the homeless person and says, okay, you have this prior conviction. Tell me about it. And the homeless person swears, right, that he didn't commit this crime, that he was falsely accused of this crime. So the church member says, okay, I'm going to help you out. You know, I can't represent you. I can't help you in legal issues because I don't have that type of training. But I do have a friend that does. So let me talk to him and see if he can help you out. And uh, try to get this conviction off your record because it's really, really affecting you. So the church member goes over to his friend who's a lawyer and talks to him and says, Look, I know this homeless person. He's got so much potential. I already walked with him. He showed so much ability and capability to be able to get ahead in life. But it's just this prior conviction that is really keeping him, holding him back. So I really need your help. You think you can help him out and represent him in court? And try to see if you can get this conviction off his record. So this lawyer friend agrees. So he feels like he's doing God's purposes and will. Because he's a Christian friend. And so he takes this case upon himself. Right? He probably can make a lot more money working somewhere else for somebody who's going to pay him. But he decides to do it uh, for free. Because he feels like he's doing God's will. And this is noble act. Isn't it? Very noble act. And so, and I believe we need people in these positions to be able to help the least. This is a posture of helping the voiceless, the powerless. There's so many programs in which the church comes together to advocate, defend the least. So we can say that this posture was being for is the third one. Being for is about advocacy. Speaking up for those who can't speak up for themselves. Representing those who can't represent themselves. And so some of the examples that I was able to notice in the Bible where Jesus advocates is being for others is he talks about what I just said at the beginning, you know, that when we help the least, we're helping him. So he's trying to encourage us. He's advocating for the least, saying, hey, when you help them, you're helping me. He also advocates for other personalities in the Gospels. One example is a woman caught in the act of adultery. He advocates for her. He defends her. She wasn't able to defend herself, so he steps in and defends her because she was being accused by the Pharisees, right? That's one example. There's also a prostitute who walked into one of the Pharisees' house, and this 
totally against the traditions of the Jewish people. To have a prostitute, an unclean person, the least of society, the marginalized, to go into the house of a Pharisee. And she begins to kiss and anoint Jesus' feet right in front of the Pharisee. And Jesus goes up to bat for this prostitute and defends her. He tells the people that were gathered, he said, This woman here has kissed my feet. She's anointed me with oil. She's really showed me that she really loves and cares for me. But you haven't given me any of these things. So this is a a good example of how Jesus advocates and defends the least. And there's so many other examples as as well, how Jesus uh, advocates for others, defends others. And I feel like it's something that we should do as well. There's so many issues in our society. There's people that don't have a voice. There's people that are powerless. That the church needs to step in to help them. You know, the Bible talks about allowing the children to come to Jesus. The Bible talks about orphans and widows. These are all people that are powerless and do not have a voice. So now, uh, that's the third one. So it leads me to the last one. Okay, so the last one is being with. So the author of this book uh, makes a claim that even though the other three are great, doing four, we should be helping people with provisions. We should be helping people with food and with health care and those type of things. But in actuality, what we're trying to get to, we do all those things because we're trying to get to the last. The reason we're doing all those things is because we really want to eventually want to get to the last one, which is being with, sharing our life with whomever God sends our way. So I'm going to try my best to try to kind of conceptualize what this last one is. Because this is really what the whole entire Bible is about and how God wants to just be with us. So let's say, for example, that you got this homeless person, right, that I use as an example. You gave him provisions, you gave him food, you gave him clothes. You walked with him, right? You uh, connected him with uh, some employers, you helped him with his resume, you uh, were a reference so they can get into some training or maybe an apartment. Okay, that didn't work out. So now you find your friend who's going to represent them legally in the court. He's able to get those charges dropped. And so after all that work, after all that energy, after all the attempts to, to help this person get back on their feet, something very discouraging happens. And it happens a lot. You see the same person at the same intersection that you first met, or when you first met. And so you can just imagine how intensely frustrating this can be for that church member who has spent all this energy, all this time, all this focus, probably in a lot of prayer, and uh, they come to their end and find out, I've done everything I can for this person. I have nothing else to offer this person. They realize that there's no amount of their resources, there's no amount of their know-how or finances or abilities or capabilities or connections or anything else that they can do to help this person. Most of their lives, they've been able to fix problems. They've just been able to we'll throw some money at it, get it fixed, or I'm a pretty smart guy, I'm just going to like, I'm just going to work it out. You know, I'm going to get on the phone, I'm going to make some phone calls, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Most of their lives, they've been able to basically fix most of the problems that come along on the road, except this time, right? So this becomes a very humbling experience because they realize that that they cannot do anything for this person. Basically, they come to their end. And for this person that is used to being able to fix most problems, it becomes a very humbling experience. And we know that when we're able to see someone succeed because of our efforts, when we're able to help somebody because of what we do for them, it makes us feel good. It makes us feel like we've accomplished something. It makes us feel like God has utilize us as his hands and feet to be able to help somebody in need. Not in this case. In this case, this person feels defeated. He feels like a failure. So there's a fork in the road. So he has to decide, all right, you can either go left or right. If you go left, basically you just go back to your life, just as usual, and 
the homeless person has to deal with the situation. You already did what you could. Or you can continue to be in this person's life even when you cannot help them. <laughs> so now, when they come to the table, let's say we go out for a cup of coffee. The homeless person shows up. The church member shows up. But now they're at this table. The homeless person has nothing to give or show. The man with abundance doesn't have anything to show either because he's already tried it all. So he's empty-handed too. So now they're on equal status. And this is where being with can begin because there's no longer any agenda. You know, I'm not trying to do for somebody because it makes me feel good. I'm not trying to do for something because they have a need. The homeless person doesn't want a relationship with me because of what I can do for them. It happens all the time. You know, I have a lot, do a lot of work in Honduras and I'm getting, just recently, I got a text message from a man that I grew up with. But I always knew him growing up as a child that he was a man in need, a poor person. And I don't know if you know, but I grew up overseas in Honduras. My dad's from Missouri, but my mom's Honduran. But I grew up the first part of my life in Honduras. And so I was able to see a lot of poverty and a lot of need. And a lot of my friends, and I thank God for it, because it allowed me to be able to interact with the poor of the poorest and the rich of the richest in that country. So it was a nice little balance. But So this is a man that I grew up with since I was a, a little kid that I knew. that was very close to me. And it's amazing how technology, everybody's able to use it now, regardless of how poor you are. And so he friended me on Facebook. And I think the only time that I really do see him is when I travel back to Honduras and see him in person. But this time with technology, he friended me. I was like, whoa, surprise. <laughs> so I said, that's cool. Yeah, I'd love to friend him. So I accept his, his request. And so the first thing that he asked me is, when are you coming back to Honduras? And I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. He wants to talk to me. And he wants to sit down with me. He wants to see how I'm doing. And I said, well, I'm hoping to go soon, hopefully this year sometime. And then he texts back and says, can you bring me some tennies? <laughs> so that's a perfect example of what I was just talking about, right? His relationship with me is about what I can do for him. And my relationship with him has been, for the most part, what I can do for, for him. And so the difference with this situation here is that there's no benefit that they can receive from one another at, the, at this coffee table. The homeless person and the church member, there's no benefit anymore. The only benefit that they have is to spend time with one another, enjoy one another, get to know each other for the sake of who they are. Ask them questions. So how do you feel about this? And try to get their opinion and, and try to go deeper into a conversation that is below the surface. And that's really when we can finally begin to be with people, no longer being for or, or doing for or doing with or being for, but now it's just being with. And so there's a few examples, and there's a lot of them in the Bible that talk about God being with us. The best example that I can talk about is the Hebrew word for God with us, which is Emmanuel. God is with us. That's what God desires to do is just to be with us. If he does anything for us, the ultimate goal for God is because he just eventually he would like to get to the place where he doesn't have to do things for us. He doesn't have to walk with us or he doesn't have to advocate for us. He just wants to spend time with us for the sake of his enjoyment and because he desires to get to know us and be in an intimate relationship with him. And really that's where Genuine friendship and relationships start. And we can just be with people. I believe that any type of other friendship that we have that doesn't seek or strive to just be with is less than the ideal. Because when we have friendship because of what we can get from that person or how we can help them or how they can help us, then it's really not a genuine relationship. But when we have relationships where we can just be with people, for their sake, with no agenda. That is the relationship that God wants with that, with us. Emmanuel, God with us. 
So I can talk about all the examples in the Bible that talk about God being with us. But I'm just going to bring some up here that I think would help us kind of understand what I'm talking about. So we know about Jesus' ministry was for 33 years, right? 30 years are pretty much silent. We don't hear much about the first 30 years of Jesus' life. But he was just with his people. He knew the traditions. He was a carpenter, had a, an earthly father and mother, um, was part of the culture. He worked, he played, he interacted, people knew him. So for 30 years, the majority of his life here on earth, he was just with. And it wasn't until the beginning of his ministry and the passion on the cross that he did any of the other stuff. But the reason why he did any of the above was because eventually he was hoping that he can be just with us. And sometimes we can just be with him. But oftentimes we're always asking for what God can do for us instead of just wanting to be with us for the sake of just being in a relationship with God. But that is why I chose to read from that verse in Revelations 21.3 that talks so much about God with us. And let me go back to the verse there in Revelation 21.3. It says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, and now we're seeing a vision of the future, right? When God comes back and establishes his kingdom forever, this is God's heart. This is God's desire. It says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. God's presence is with us. And he will dwell with them. He didn't say anything about doing for or walking with or advocating for. He just said, and he will dwell with them. He will just be present. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So as we strive to help the least in our communities, and we see all the need, I'm not saying that any of the above that I men mentioned are bad. But if we go in just wanting to do for people and wanting to walk with them and not have that relationship and get to know them and at some level, then we're missing the heart of God. Because the heart of God is for us to get to know people and not just to see people for or what we can do for them or what they can do for us. But instead, it's really care about who the person is. Sit down with them, get to know them at some level. I'm not saying that we're always going to get it right, but I feel like that's the Lord's heart. So as this church has his hands and feet, that should also be our heart of just to be with others. And I think when we have that in mind of just being with others, others will begin to feel God's presence. They'll be able to see the character of God through our lives because we are following Christ and his desires and relationships and his desire for us, the relationship he desires with us. We take that. And that's a relationship that we get to foster with others the least. And that's, it's a big challenge because it's not comfortable and it's messy. And it's not always fun to be with somebody that is a homeless person, for example. It's not fun to be with that person. We always try to escape and we always try to just do it from a distance. And I'm not saying that it's, it's always going to work out to perfection. But as a church, you know, that should be our desire our intent and that's all i have that's all i have so that book impacted me his things that i talked about today aren't exactly what samuel wells was describing in his book but there are a lot of similarities and i just felt to kind of just go off script a little bit today and just just talk about that kind of about some of the things that god has been working in my life i thought it'd be good for me to, to share them with you because it's really impacted my life it's in, impacted the way I see others, the way I see relationships. And if it's impacted my life, I feel like it could be something that maybe you can use as well as you seek to, to serve the least. All right, so let us move on to the next order of service here. And I guess we can title that as the sermon is God with us. I think that would be a, a good sermon title. All right, the next hymn is hymn number 371. If you would turn your books to uh, hymn number 371. 